let's talk about the the stuff that um, again I know you've got to do all these other topics and I, whenever I talk about these things I always say like I get it crime is important you know the, all these things that you're dealing with on a day to day basis on the campaign trail are important if not more important than the things we're going to talk about because of what we do here because we are sports we're going to talk about the sports topics that I think intersect with politics and what it is that you're dealing with and because uh, you and I had talked before about the Preakness the Pimlico thing I guess let's start there and I and I imagine in your world right now it's this is relevant in two different ways you're the city council president so it's super relevant at the moment for you as this goes in front of the the general assembly and there's going to be a decision made Mm -hmm. um are you confident that this is going to happen are you confident that even before you would take office as mayor there would already be resolution to this issue yeah i think i'm very confident this is this is for me in three ways right um city council president now running for mayor but more importantly i grew up in park heights yeah. right so this uh, impacts me in a way that it doesn't impact anyone else in the race because my family still lives there hmm. so when you think about it I, th- I have the utmost confidence that it will get done and it will get done in a responsible way a uh, one that keeps the preakness there one that does not forego the rest of the neighborhood development that understands what has to happen there that it has to be yes we have to keep the race yes we have to invest in the track we have to invest in that area to make sure that it's bigger than the track though and we can do that without forgetting all those families that have been living there and suffering for years as the track and the neighborhood has declined and built from our strength built with them, allow them to stay as well, while we continue to have a facility there that has one of the most important horse races in the country and in the world there, and then also build to how we can use that facility for other things. Do you believe, or do you get the sense, as you talk about your family being there, that the neighborhood is buying into this proposal, and that they believe you know, they, uh, there's been a lot made of how much they have felt misled mm-hmm. over the years by the various owners of the track, by the government, by the state, everybody, that they have felt misled about where things were going. Do you get the sense that the Park Heights neighborhood believes in this proposal and the future of their community if this does indeed pass? There's a lot of work to do on that, right? When you've been burnt as many times as the neighborhood has been burnt, uh, I can't think of how many times I've heard that the track was going to be renovated since I've been alive, right? So you have to understand that that's going to take a lot of work. But people do feel like this may be a different case. And it's up to those of us in government or those of us involved in the process, all the folks who are going to be involved in the community partners there, to continue to push that. But again, go back to my first point, it's also about involving the community as we go along. That's how you get the buy-in. You can't build build around community mm-hmm. you have to build with community and that's how you're going to get the buy-in and i think that's something that we can get of course you have to get to the first hurdle so i remember talking to you about it that, that was the significant part of there being a community center at the track right that like this the, the concept being you want to feel like the community owns part of what this is going to be now moving forward at pimlico right yeah it's not just that it's, it's that that you know we have to think about the jobs that are going to come from the remodeling of the track and the jobs that are going to stay there thinking about the access to we're thinking about again the investment when the investment goes in the track we know that that's going to spur investment other way other alongside the, the track and the other neighborhoods you already have the big redevelopment area that's going to happen just south of the track in the park heights neighborhood having all that synergy together and having that synergy with the community and again that this is not just uh, they're going to build a new pimlico and a new park heights and bring in new people but remembering those folks who are there and even bringing back folks that le- left we always say uh in the neighborhood growing up everyone who left the neighborhood, most of us who, who no longer live there as adults, uh, moved up to Owens Mills and Randallstown, yeah. right? When yeah. the houses got knocked mm-hmm. down, uh, culturally in a neighborhood, we call them Park Heights North because <laughs> that's where everyone <laughs> we grew up with lives, except for those of us who still live in the city. It's about trying to get those folks to come back too. And believe in their own neighborhood, believe yeah. in their own community. He is City Council President Brandon Scott. He's with us here in the Live Casino Hotel Studio on GCR. Um, let me move from that because it sort of ties in the the future of the track, the future of the race ties in with the sports betting topic that is also one that, again, might well be settled before you ever take office as mayor of the city of Baltimore. It looks like that's headed towards the ballot um, here this November in the state of Maryland. I think the question from a lot of people is what does it look like once it gets on the ballot? Um, do you feel like it's important that a new Pimlico, a new track that if we're going to have sports betting, it needs to be something that can be done at that new track, that it needs to be specific to that. I know the casinos are 
sort of fighting right now, especially because of this agreement saying, hey, look, if, if we're going to have to pay a little bit more, then we need to have the betting happen at the casinos and nowhere else. Yeah, I think that and we know that uh, NFL teams are going to be trying to get it done. Sure, right of we, course. We know at yeah. least one. Yeah, right. It's already been. Yeah, absolutely. And one in Maryland and D.C. that wants, wants it to be there. I think that when you do this, we have to just have to do it in a responsible way. Let's be honest. People that want to bet on sports in, in Maryland right now, they're betting on sports, right? They're draft kings, whatever one, whatever they want to do, uh, folks are going to do it. What I think that we have to be very careful, though, uh, again, is when we roll these things out, putting the, pl- the things in place to make sure that with the communities where this are, we're going to have things just like we did with the casino for addiction and all of those of kind of things. Those are critically important. But most important is what are we going to use the money for? If the money's going to go to funding and fully funding the Kerwin Commission and helping out with uh, finally fully funding Maryland schools, then I'm all for it. But we have to put that in law, on paper, in writing, so that it cannot be changed without a policy change. But uh, I'm for one. I think that just thinking about where we would like to have it, the racetrack is a great place to have it. Yeah. But also, when folks are going into uh, the NFL game, right, if you're going to – a Raven Steelers game in Baltimore on the Sunday night or a Thursday night Thanksgiving game. What better place for you to be able you to like do to be that? able to the idea of being able to bet right be there at the right there at the at the place because we know that that would get so much more influence. And then of course you should have it at the casino. So I think that we need to have strike a balance on it, that. Would it? Do you do you fear again knowing how intimately you know this agreement, this proposal for the new Pimlico? Do you fear that it would hurt? the future of the track if there wasn't sport I, and I, I bring up in context right when the slots thing happened the 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 owners of the track at the time said this dooms us you you not putting allowing us to have slots here at the track this dooms us do you worry that it would hurt what we're trying to do in pushing forward this new pimlico if it came without sports betting, why there would be sports betting elsewhere in the state? Yeah, it's a concern, right? But we also know that um, there was a deal struck that even though Pimlico didn't have slots, they get slots money for the for the slots racetrack impact funds uh, for the neighborhood, slots money for the neighborhood, and we can look at that. I think it's very important that we consider it. Uh, if we're talking about having a 21st century place, we know uh, the state of horse racing as it is, and again, it's about having a facility that's able to be used consistently. A- absolutely right. right. No One Things that you know, I talked about with you before is being able. Some of the best concerts, largest concerts in the city, have happened there. Mm-hmm. Thinking about things that can happen there yep. that way, all that kind of stuff. Making it a sport, year-round facility, a year-round 100%. facility, and sports betting could definitely be a part of that. And a place where people might just come in, like on a Friday night, yep. you know, which is something that obviously we haven't. You know, Watch some sports games, exactly. enjoy a little, maybe a little live music. That's the kind of stuff that we have that's, to be and thinking And that's about. what they did down in Louisville, and that was yep. how they were able to find new life and, and sort of make uh, the Churchill Downs beyond just being the place we go to the Kentucky Derby. That's exactly. the concept. Exactly. Okay, so that's one facility that we're moving forward with. There's another facility that over the years there's been an awful lot of conversation about moving forward. And again, as we always have this conversation, we take nothing away from Frank Remish and his team, and what they've done is unreal. Yes, it is. At Royal Shout Farms out Arena. to Frank. It's, I mean, like we, we can write a book one day about what's happened since they took over and the events they've managed to get to this city and how they've continued to make that facility uh, lively and vibrant, uh, despite the realities that we all know that we're dealing with when you look at the building. But... I, and this is not me saying I want this taken away from Frank, because I think a lot of people would say, if we get a new facility, I want Frank to be the one to run that, right? Um, it, where are you with the need for a new arena, with the need to maybe improve the standing arena? Like, where are you with the arena issue that seems to, unfortunately, just go away every few years simply because we don't have an NBA team or an NHL team that, that forces the issue? Well, I think that first and foremost, again, you, you cannot – uh, say thank you enough to those folks when you have an arena that is literally older than my dad yeah <laughs> right look, look they pay me nothing i'm <laughs> this is just me saying like i it's nobody you have a brain like you're in this city you know what that facility is right. like and yet you've seen what it is they've managed to pull off in the last decade when you have that facility be one of the top grossing yeah. in the country and in the region when i say that the people I actually said that to one of my staff members on the way in she said really I'm right like, yeah <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, like I've I've been there, Brandon. Yeah. I know it's, <laughs> it's packed, man. Yeah, right. But we know. Listen, I was there for the for the Tank Davis fight, right? 
it was one of, it was one of the great nights in the history of packed. our city packed it, when you say packed you need, we need to describe this to people it was one of my favorite nights i've ever been anywhere because it was packed and nobody knew where their seats were no Everybody just was just walking around. It, it was, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. I think I took like six hundred selfies with people outside <laughs> of uh, in the in the foyer around my around my seat that night. And I actually, for the record, I predicted the fight. I said, I don't care what he do, he going out in two. So I predicted Very the nicely fight. Nicely done, Muhammad sir. Ali, nice. better, than, Muhammad better than Ali Tyson style. Fury, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before I went in there, but we ha- we know that this ha- conversation has to be had, and that we knew a new arena, right? But we also know that a new arena is very important. The convention center is very important. And when we consider, we have to consider how we do both or prioritize one or the other. You know, I think that we understand that renovating the arena will be extremely difficult because what I worry about, and I know what Frank worries about, if we do it on that site, then you lose an event. You lose process. those shows, and they may right. never come back. If they go out to the UMBC yep. event center, and I love Dr. Hrabowski, they may never come back, right? So finding another location in the city, funding that location is is just as important. And I think that what we have to understand is that we have to have a new arena, right? Because, listen, chances of us, you know, my dream is to have an NBA team in Baltimore. Outside of the Orioles winning the World Series, there's nothing more in the world of sports that I want, right? But chances of that are It's slim. unlikely, right? Very unlikely, right? right? However... We don't necessarily need to go that big, right? We don't necessarily, but if you go to a nice size arena, you know, 15, 16,000, we could host again. We did way back in the 90s the host again. Tournament. First round, yep. second round of the tournament. We could host. Get Tim Duncan back get, here, get, right? Yeah, like that's yeah. The, oh, man, it was were, awesome. Were you there? Yeah, I, I was a kid, but yes. I mean, uh, like yeah. every, <laughs> by the way, if we were, if, I want to do this book one day. There are 70,000 people that claim to have been there that week. Yeah. There are 70,000 oh, people awesome. in this city that claim that they Just were like there. It's like Cal's game, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. Correct. When you, when you have those kind of events and something else and something that, that Frank, if he's listening, I know you know I'm going to bring up. Uh, I remember when I was actually working in the mayor's office and we were working on this Knicks and Wizards pregame. Mm-hmm. And they were mm-hmm. everyone's worried. I was like, won't be a problem. They're like, what do you mean? I said, it's going to sell out. Won't be a problem. That's how you know. Because above all. Baltimore is a basketball town. When you think of Baltimore athletes, people from Baltimore who are athletes, this is the NBA, right? And but, one swimmer. And, yeah, and Michael <laughs> Bell's right, right. And, and Cal. Uh, but when you and now NFL, geez, the way it's taken true, over right? in the NFL. It's true. Uh, shout Shaq, out to Mr. Fuller in the and Shaq Bear. Oh yeah, Super Bowl, the, Super Bowl champion. The, yeah. the, the Super Bowl with interception. Right. Um, but we could again. Talk to the Wizards about having, you know, five, ten games a, a year here, right? Something, you know, no one's going to the games down there anyway because they <laughs> suck. But they haven't won since they left. I want to point that out for the record. But All facts. <laughs> well, they did win one title, One time, yeah, yeah. They won one time. But they were still. Yeah, they they really, were, yeah basically, it was the Baltimore right. Bullets team right, that went right, to D.C. Right. That's a great point. You're right. It was yeah. just like, you know. Uh, but we have to do that in a responsible way because we know – all the other financial challenges that the city has and what we have to do is figure out the best public private partnership that gets this done allows us to continue to host events here and build a world-class facility along with a convention center so that we can again raise our game because if we're doing what we're doing with the facility that we have now just imagine what we would be able to do if we had a world-class 21st century facility. So when you say that, again, you're you're as connected as anybody else in this room. Ri- I mean, I guess there is the mayor currently too, yeah. but you're the city council president. Do you feel like there is private movement that it can be done in your term as mayor, or at least started yeah, I in think your that, term as mayor? I think that, listen, that's a part of being a leader, right? Leader, uh, The mayor can convene folks and can figure these things out and bringing people together and saying this is what we're going to do, but we have to do it in a way that is not – um, has it has been done before and forgetting and making the taxpayers foot the bill of something that some many of them won't be able to afford to go to. We have to make sure that this is something that will be for all of Baltimore, built with jobs for people from Baltimore, continuing jobs from people from Baltimore, and built in a way that keeps all the other things that we know that we have to do in our city fund our schools yep. more we know we have to do that make sure that our infrastructure is working because you can't have a functioning arena without functioning infrastructure dealing with crime all of those kind of issues have to be considered but a leader someone that wants to truly uh 
make this city and transform this city into the best Baltimore it has ever been will lead in the way of bringing people together and say, we need to get this done for the city. He is City Council President Brandon Scott. He's with us here in studio for our GCR mayoral forum. Now, with that in mind, you bring up a couple of those issues that kind of tie in to the one other topic that I wanted to bring up, which is the future of the Baltimore Orioles. And so let me start by sort of giving you the generic low-hanging fruit one, right, which is do you have any concern at all about the situation with the lease and the long-term future of the Orioles in general? I don't. Uh, not as of yet. Uh, I take people at their word, and the word that has been given to me is that the Baltimore Orioles will always be the Baltimore Orioles. And for the record, I uh, believe in the we you know the 76ers had the process. Yeah, I, look, I I'm believe on. in the process with a big O uh, for us here in Baltimore. So I know it's painful, uh, but we will be back on top in, in no time. We just have to continue to support the team. I don't want to be the only person in the stadium after opening day this year. Continue to come out, be there, watch these young players as they grow so that when you realize that they're superstars in a, in a few years, you won't just know them then. You'll know them now and see their growth. So let's combine that topic with the thing that everybody brings up, which is getting people back to the ballpark. And I know that part of this is, look, the team – they need to win more games like i understand that's part of the conversation but you know the other elements that are laid out there for everybody which is of course that there's a conception around the rest of the state that it's dangerous to come to baltimore now and i don't want to be here and obviously ever since freddie gray there's been sort of an opinion shift um for a lot of people around the state it the realities of that how you address that as mayor whether that just being you know misconceptions and trying to, to repaint the picture versus whatever realities that come along with that and maybe some of the other things that people bring up when we have this conversation like that public transportation you know is not maybe exactly where you would want it for getting mass amounts of people downtown to a baseball game yeah listen perception is reality but i think there's a little bit of uh, everything going on here right i'm glad you brought up 2015 because as you know we actually yep. had a good year in 2015 and after the unrest people continue to come back to the ballpark and when folks say that like uh that doesn't have a b big portion to do with it and i said well look people still go to the ravens games and it's right down the street right it's that we know that that has a big part to do with it but what we have to do on our side is we have been infected with this disease of violence in baltimore my entire life it's like a cancer and when you don't treat the disease you only try to treat a symptom it continues to spread what we will do as mayors that we will fight this issue uh in a way a lot similar to transportation. I always say that fighting crime in Baltimore is a lot like having to be on the Acela and the regional train at the same hmm. time. Hmm. You have to focus on the day-to-day -day stuff. Focus on the people that you know are committing the crimes, the violent repeat offenders, removing them. Focus on the flow of illegal guns into the city because many, if not most, of the weapons that are being used from crimes in Baltimore not only come from outside of the city, but many also come from outside of the state. Focusing on that, making sure the police department is 21st century, has the, the technology that they ran, that's ran efficiently and effectively, is not deployed on 1959's data, but 2020 data that is responding to crimes in a 2020 way, not a 1999 or 1984 way. That's what we're going to do each and every day to do that. But then also, when we when the city's doing all the other things right, when we're picking up trash, when we're creating opportunities for small businesses, when we're creating festivals and things that attract people to the city, we can bring people back to the ballpark and working with the team as the team continues to grow and gets better every year because we know we have a young team, right? We have to understand. It's no different than imagine. Remember how it was when we had Brian Robinson, she, Adam came here in 2008. Yeah. There was Mark no, Akers. and Mark Akers, there was nobody there. Yep. I remember telling this story, and this is a sad Oreo story. We, yeah, we got a lot of those. We, <laughs> yeah, in, in our generation, absolutely. We made the playoffs uh, my seventh grade year. That's the year that a young man by the name of Jeffrey, Let's Jeffrey not Mayer. Do this. Let's we not had, do yes, this. we're going to do it. <laughs> Snatched the ball from Tony Tarasco. The worst night of my the life. The worst night of my life. It's the first time that my aunt, my mom and dad were on vacation. My aunt was watching. It's the first time she ever let me curse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> think about that for me. That's I was wild. in seventh grade. <laughs> we did not make the playoffs. By the way, end. we're basically the same age. Yeah. I was. I, I guess I was 13. I was 13 when yeah. this occurred. We did not make the playoffs again until I was a city council person. Yeah. In 2012. Yeah. That's how long I suffered. And I remember sitting at the stadium and there being 
two people next to me. And then six years later, they were eight. And then they were 10. And the next thing I knew was packed again. We can do that again. But we just have to continue to build. To your transportation point, uh, we know that the next mayor is going to have to be a leader on this because right now in Maryland, uh, the governor has too much power when it comes to NTA. When you think about successful cities that have 21st century public transportation, they have a regional model. And one of the things that I think is most important for the next mayor to do is partner with the county executives in the count, Baltimore County, Howard, Anne Arundel, and even Hofford to some extent, and work together with the folks in Annapolis to go to having a regional transportation model so that we can build these things out, right? Investing in different ways. Another conversation that's lingered around this yeah. for, for for decades. Yes. Now it's time for someone to do it because if we had not walked away from a billion dollars of public money, free public money from the feds to build a new subway line, which, by the, for the record, they could have used to do something else if they would have just told them that uh, alternative, maybe finish the existing subway line, build it from Social Security to Lexington Market, invest in bus rapid transit. That's what the next mayor is going to have to do. Be a leader in making sure that we're doing those kind of things and building an infrastructure for us to have 21st century public transportation. Now, all of this, being mayor of Baltimore is easier when you just, I assume that once you take over, every picture that you put up every ad you run just as basically Lamar Jackson's face, right? Like, that's the <laughs> way that it works then? Like, yeah. Yeah, bring your business to Baltimore because this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lamar is a is a monster, man. And uh, I listen, I don't want to rehash this, but I remember the last week of the season I said, no, he should at least play the first half. Oof. Oof. I remember. Oof. And then I, I was hosting a watch party at a bar in Fells Point, and – and when they went for the first fourth down, I said, why? It's early in the game. And then the second one, I'm like, Justin Tucker's going to – he can make this backwards. Right, blindfolded, sure. Blindfolded. Yeah. Kick yeah. it, make it 14-9, to nine, put the pressure back on them. I, what, I, what I know that they will do is now they know what they have to do for next year. They're going to have to build in more surprises. They're going to have to uh, up the game on the offensive end. We do need to make some investments on the defensive side, especially in the secondary, in my opinion, uh, to, to get some things. Interesting. Yeah, because some of the guys are getting old. Well, I, look, I think, <laughs> I think <laughs> that's the reality. There's a decision they got to make about Jimmy Smith, yeah, right? Like, Jimmy's they got a couple not, things. And, you know, the gentleman from Seattle, he's a little old. Marcus Peters, sure. Yeah, 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 he means Earl Thomas. Oh, yeah, Earl Thomas. Earl Thomas Sorry, is a little you, old. Thank you. So yes. Earl Thomas is a little old, man. So, you know, we, we – we have chasing to chasing safety for a while. Far, yeah, father time is undefeated. I mean, I hear you. It's I hear you. Undefeated. I just, I'm worried about the pass rush. Like, get me another I, pass rush. You can get one of those too. But I'm just saying, <laughs> think about how quick. Think about. Let's think about Richard Sherman. Right? He was the best. And then now people are looking to go at him. Uh. He still did pretty well yeah, this he year. He, he did. largely had a good, he did. Yeah, good season. Yeah, until, In the Super Bowl. Yeah, yes, yeah. you're right. In the until Super Bowl. he's out there sure. by himself. He's sure. great when he has over-the-top covers. But if it's him, one-on-one, beat like a drum every time because he's slow now. That's I've, it. I've been clamoring for them to just invest in wide receiver for the entirety of my life. Well, so yeah, that, yeah. I well, I, another, just now, uh, I just naturally assume that that's not going to happen. Hey, maybe with DaCosta, right? Maybe with DaCosta <laughs> they're going to start. And we've seen already Marquise Brown, right? Paid dividends. Yeah, oh, man, he was, he's, he's me, really good. Give me one more. Give me more, one, more, one more wide receiver. Give me one right. more special – Skilled player to put out there, right? On yeah. the field. We, and I think that they'll be fine. We just have to make sure in the progression for Lamar Jackson. You know what I think is an underrated asset for him? Uh, when folks get so worried about him getting hurt, I say, I'm not worried about that. I said, because his backup is the best thing that could ever happen to him. Because mm -hmm. his backup can consistently say, yeah. don't you, allow you know them to happens, do to right. you what they did to you, me. You know exactly, exactly what happened. You know exactly what happened. So I think that's a great thing. Brandon Scott, where can people be following you? Uh, you can follow me at Council Prez, B P R E S B M S on Twitter and Instagram. And then uh, I have two Facebook, Facebook.com slash Brandon for Baltimore, and then Facebook.com slash Council Prez BMS. That's the way it goes, man. And the website for the campaign is? It's BrandonForBaltimore.com. Very good. Brandon Scott, I really appreciate you coming in and hanging out with us today. This is I've always enjoyed our conversations Thank over you. the years, and the passion that you have for this city has been very evident since the moment you stepped into this public sphere. You care a great deal about this place. Thank you. And it's been well served um, to this point. We look forward to seeing what's coming for you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. Go I love that. Brandon